always nice. And we're live. So welcome everybody to yet another live interview show with Become a Fearless Father. And today my guest is Perry Martin. Now, I already had like five minutes to talk to him, so I'm very, very excited. We were talking a little bit about the absolute surreal circumstances that all of a sudden our lives just changed like that. And what comes with that? Well, a lot of people are struggling. Not physically, right? We know that they're struggling physically, but mentally. So there he goes to me. Look, one of the topics that we definitely could talk about that I love talking about is mental strength and resiliency. I'm like, let's do this. So, Perry, let's start off with that, right? How does one in in this absolute surreal circumstances that we're in right now make sure that they stay or become mentally strong and resilient? Ah, that's a big, big question. And I want to, <laughs> I, I, I want to preface what I'm about to do with what I've done over the last month. Mm -hmm. So class, I work really closely with business owners all over the world. And so what happened about a month ago, maybe five weeks ago, because now time's morphed, I'm sure everyone's experiencing this time morph. Mm -hmm. um, I could see what was happening around the world and my clients started to get their businesses shut down through legislation. Yeah. Um, and then as business was being shut down, there were knock on uh, impact and there were more of my clients businesses under threat. So I was on this uh, every day on Zoom doing sweat, SWOT analysis with these business clients all over the world. And one of the things that I really observed was that they had lost their ability to think and mm. to think strategically. Now, they were relying on me to think strategically. Um, for them because they were so emotional, their intelligence was almost downgraded. Yep. And I was like, wow, this is just absolutely amazing because the brain science behind that, by the way, is that fear and terror whack the amygdala, the, the, mm -hmm. the flight and fight area of the brain. Also, your brainwave patterns will, will shoot up into beta or what they call high beta brainwave patterns. Mm -hmm. And both of those things, by the way, are really bad for the body because it's like you're seeing a tiger, but you're seeing that tiger 24 hours a day. Um, and once the amygdala's uh, whacked, the uh, adrenals are spiked. So there's cortisol running through the, through the body. Um, blood flow decreases to the neocortex, um, which is all your executive brain function. Mm -hmm. So you just don't think straight. You don't think properly. And uh, I've been a meditator for... Geez, 36 years. Wow. Um, I, went, I had an apprenticeship, a 10 year apprenticeship that I might tell you about later if, it's, if you find it interesting. But um, in that, I was trained, and this is why I'm, I'm taking the long way to answer the question. I was mm -hmm. trained to meditate in very uncomfortable circumstances. Mm. My, we, we, would, we were trained to meditate in comfortable circumstances, but we would have to do things like exercise in really hot rooms. Mm -hmm. so that we were forced to bring our awareness in or sit in postures and meditate. And so what happens is, what happened for me from that practice is I learned to have a still mind in the center of supposedly painful circumstances. Now, there's all science behind this now. So, again, key thing, meditators have a huge advantage in times like this. Mm -hmm. uh, huge advantages because... Well, meditation reverses what we just talked about. So all the science will show meditators will actually have shrunken amygdalas. Mm -hmm. right? so, so they're less activated by fear and they tend to have far more energy or blood flow into the, the prefrontal cortex, which is mm -hmm. the thinking center. So um, the, the first thing, and to come back to answer that question, is to learn to calm your nervous system down. So you don't have to be a full-time meditator like me, but even learning to slow breath down or even taking five minutes out. Uh, as, as a meditator, there's a, there's a transcendental nature where you actually go, it's almost like you go beyond the mind, the talking, chatting mind. And, and if you do that enough, you sort of get cohabitated or... or you, you, your, your habitual place of living is one of peace. Um, and so when you move away from that, you've just got all these tools to come back to that because that's mm -hmm. what you're trained to do. Does that sort of answer the question? There's more things. Yeah. Right, yeah, there's yeah, way yeah. more things, but that's the foundation <laughs> thing. Uh, no, I understand. I, I wasn't expecting the, the answer because in reality, 
it's it's very simple i mean meditation is not simple but it's it's like you know you can start to meditate and that action on its own is a simple action you know correct what I mean? correct and i'll take it even further than that because what happens is most people can't control their minds now so meditation like there's there's different forms of meditation because meditation is a relaxing uh, has a relaxing impact on the physiology but if you're a trained meditator what you're actually trying to do is drop your mind at will Mm -hmm. So the more you practice that, the more power you have, and I'll use an analogy here, the more power you have over this thing, your mind doesn't fool you. Where most people are running around and if a pattern gets triggered off, so a pattern is a thinking, it might be anxiety, it might be I'm worried about this or it might be anger or it might be inner criticism, those people have no tools for controlling that. So the, their mind, <laughs> but if you're a meditator, you've seen that. You've actually observed that happening and you can just drop it. So meditation is a foundational tool for all, other all the other tools that you would use mm -hmm. to change your behaviours or, or, or how you're, you're thinking. So as an example, if, if you're a meditator and you're trained, you can, you can drop the story because you're practised in dropping your awareness away from the attachment to its mind, which means you take it less seriously. You start to disidentify I can see this behavior, I can see that. So you're now separate from it. And the moment you're separate from anything, you have more control over it. So as an example, I can say to my mind, I'm not interested in those, those emotions. Mm -hmm. Those emotions do not serve me. Mm -hmm. And because you're trained as a meditator to have control, you can drop them straight away. So mm -hmm. probably over the last few years, I've started to understand, you know, how some of the old, you know, so the, 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 the martial artists, because my mm -hmm. original teachers were martial artists and they were trained to be meditators in battle and mm -hmm. they would have to look at their opponent, right? So the opponent's holding a staff or a sword and they have to be so present and observant and have no fear, no terror and be very present to what's happening. So they're the states the old martial artists used to be able to get into through learning to train their minds. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Now, two things pop in my head that I quickly want to share with the people. So for those of you that are watching and are like meditation and not so sure, like I love, there's a short video. It's like four or five minutes by Shokyal Rinpoche, I think his name is. If not, I'll, I'll share the link later in the comment section. And the guy talks about the monkey mind. And I love that. And he explains that. It's short, it's sweet, and it shares exactly what Perry just shared with us and how important meditation is. And second, I'm so happy that my four-year-old and six-year-old, I just put them on meditation, so every morning they do a minute, um, which now becomes more and more important with you know the fear and the stress that we, we're getting. Oh, oh, totally. So that's great, Perry. Thank you so much for sharing. Now, we don't know anything about you, Perry, so share with can, us. Can I just share one thing to your listeners? And, and oh, more than one. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Look, look, don't get frightened by meditation. If you don't want to meditate, there's a very simple thing you can do. So there's mm -hmm. these great, great apps at the moment. And these apps are uh, online, you know, you can get them on your phone. And they're what they call guided meditations. Now, if you're going to be a serious meditator, you learn to meditate without guided meditations. But guided meditations are amazing. You mm -hmm. can see the Wim Hof method has become huge all around the world. Yeah. All these things, right, are actually meditative practices. They're not advanced meditative practices, but they will reset the nervous system. Both will do a really good job. They don't cost anything. You, you can put a headphone on and listen to the guided meditation. It's done in five or ten minutes. Yep, anyway. No, no, I appreciate that. Absolutely. And, and yeah. yeah, you mentioned Wim Hof. I heard a lot of, like I follow him. I heard a lot of noise from a lot of people saying like, look, um, you know, I got affected by coronavirus, but Wim Hof's breathing techniques and meditation techniques really helped me to come through this and overcome this. So it's, it's yeah, man, we got to go back to, you know, trusting in our bodies and trusting more in nature than, than swallowing all those pills. Anyway, um, Perry, share with us a little bit about your background story. And I always like my guests to share their family setup so people exactly know, you know, <laughs> your dad, how big your family is, et cetera, et cetera, right? Sure. Okay. Great, great question. Well, family is the most important thing to me. Um, I, I have a love story. I've been with my wife for 25 years, 26 right. years. Wow. I, I have two kids. Um, uh, one's 28, one's 22. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, they're the redeeming, they make me a man. 
Mm. Okay? That they make me a man. So for my love for my family, so I work with a thing that I call noble intention. And noble intention is, well, what do you serve? Who do you serve? Well, I serve my wife. Mm. My, my wife is a beautiful human being, and so she's aspirational to me. So I serve my wife. And what I mean by serve my wife, well, my love for her and her values will ensure that I clean my own act up. Mm -hmm. All right? Do, do what I'm supposed to do. Do, do, do what I need to do. So, <laughs> right? Because it's, a, it's a, um, organizing the love of the family. And I'm sure you understand this class. You can, you've already mm -hmm. look at the love that you have for your family. It, it ensures that you have a good moral code. It ensures that you are responsible. It ensures that you're a good man. So mm -hmm. that's my family set up. And do you want to know about my past? Because that's. Absolutely, man. Share, share a little bit of insight so people, you know, get to know Perry. And, okay, and, yeah. So I, I, I'll share a bit more about my family. We're, we're, we're a fun unit, so we've always had a lot of fun together, um, my mm. family and I. Um, love Love's really important. Beauty is really important to us. So beauty means just having a lot of beauty around. My wife's Italian, so we're around good food, good wine, uh, yeah. family get-togethers. Uh, it's all about community. Um uh, we've been fortunate enough to live a good life because of, of, of business and we've up until a little while ago we could travel all over the world. I'm a surfer, my boys are surfers, so we'd always nice. go away surfing and sailing and doing all those fun things. Um, my life wasn't like that, so uh, there there is a story and I, I talk highly of my family because I, I consider my family a redemption force because I wasn't brought up to be the person that I am these days. I grew up around mm. some fairly heavy duty experiences, uh, violence. So violence was a big part of my life growing up in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Where I grew up, you had to fight. Um, and by the age of 17, I was in something called Borstal, um, which is juvenile detention. Mm -hmm for violent offending and uh, I remember being in this this group so they used to put us as a group and we had to talk about our anger and our, our violent tendencies and I remember being in this room and I'm in there with all the gang guys and I'm just thinking to myself is this how I really want to live is this where I want to go um, and of course the answer was no Mm -hmm. So that, I suppose, like anything, that decision, no, I, I don't want to be how I am. I don't want to be like this, um, put me on a journey. Now, I, I had a lot of violence in me, like an incredible amount of violence, I can tell you. And I'm a little guy. When I started, mm -hmm. I'm 5'10". Five, five, mm -hmm. um, and I live in an area where there are a lot of big people. And what happened growing up is my violence or my blind rage gave me power. Mm. So I had, you know, what's called uh, um, like a madness to me when I would fight. The madness was I didn't care about myself. I had so much rage I didn't care about myself. I, couldn't, I didn't care if I got hurt. I didn't care if they killed me in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. it, I'd just be fighting. And so big guys get scared of that. Mm -hmm. They know you're like a mad dog. So there was a power in that as well. So the thing that I didn't want to be, I decided not to be was something that had given me power in my life and protection in my life, the violence. So uh, <laughs> um, this set me on a journey and the journey was, well, uh, you know, how do you deal with this? And interesting enough, um, most people, so I started to seek help mm -hmm. and most of the help I really didn't like because it was judgmental. Mm -hmm. So people would see me, they'd know I was so violent and it was like they, wanted to fix me because they hadn't accepted their violence. I just, there was something not right. My first teacher, uh, a gentleman called Eddie, he, he was the opposite. He just looked at me one day when I first met him. He said, you're really violent, aren't you? And I said, yep. And he put his hand on my back and took me through to his room. And it was such an act of love that I felt loved even though I was violent. He was my first teacher and he taught me one of the most important things, which is, um, if I'm working with someone 
because you, my working life is fairly interesting. I'll tell you about that in a second. If you're interested, this may be boring to you, but anyway. No, no, for me, it's very interesting. So you go on. Yeah, yeah so, so um, um, yeah, that, that key principle is if you're working with someone, if you're, if, if you're not free of judgment, you're not really creating a safe environment for them. So for mm -hmm. someone to change, they have to feel, they need to feel okay about who they are. Um, any sense of judgment already reinforces their internal self-criticism for who they are. Mm -hmm. So the, the teacher, my early teacher, Eddie, he, he really helped me start to be okay with the level of violence that I had. And the moment I could become okay, and just let me be clear about that, okay means you mightn't like the violence, but you can forgive yourself and be okay with the violence because you know why you're violent because of what you grew up with, right? Mm -hmm. So that sense of self-compassion means that you can now start to own. Own means, yeah, I am violent. And so I went through an apprenticeship and it was a full bore apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn to see everything about my uh, ego structure, everything about how I operated and um, own it, which is what they call shadow work, which I had to, to yeah, it was full bore. Now in mm -hmm. doing that, I start to clean my act up. And this is when I first started to be taught the meditation practices mm -hmm. because I'll, I'll just show you this right as an example. So if you've got to break a habit, let's just imagine I'll, I'll just use violence as an example um, or a, just use anger because everyone here will relate to anger. So True. if someone <laughs> make, yeah, if something makes you angry, you you usually only know that you've gotten angry probably about nine to 10 seconds mm -hmm. after the anger's flushed through your body, which means that you're actually uh, unconscious. Now there's brain science behind us now too. So what happens is uh, in that anger, you might've said something really horrible to that person, or you might've hit that person, or you've done something you don't really wanna do. Now everyone mm -hmm. here would have experienced that in the anger. So, um, and and pe people usually observe it after the fact. They go, oh, God, I was so angry and I shouldn't have some, done that or I shouldn't have said that. Well, that person is, is, and it's not their fault, but they're being unconscious because they've not been taught what we would consider introspective art. So if mm -hmm. you're a trained meditator, what happens is you're so present in your body, the moment that someone triggers oh. your uh, anger, you sense it in your body, right, because all emotion shows up in your body, and so you, you are then able to drop it and make a decision mm -hmm. about it. So you see and feel the anger and you're able to go because you're trained as a meditator. And I'll show, I can show you the, how, how the, the, me the mechanism of this works in a second. So you mm -hmm. see that and therefore you can suddenly make a choice. Well, is that going to serve the matter? This means that you can, you're wiser. You can now start to break free of the patterns of behavior that would typically unconsciously just drive you. Exactly. Yeah. So that's sort of part of my journey after the violence was to um, clean up a lot of these behaviors uh, through those practices. And I'll just finish this off because, of course, when I met my wife, uh, all I ever wanted to do was be a good dad so um, and a good husband. Mm -hmm. um, so... All of a sudden, I have people that, you know, I love and I care for and just more reasons to clean my act up mm -hmm. <laughs> from what I was programmed and conditioned to be. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well, well I, can talk, I can talk about this stuff for days. <laughs> and I love it. I can listen to it for days because I think yeah. it's very, very important, especially anger. I mean, you hear it all the time. Like, how can I control my emotions when my child does this or when my wife says X, right? Whatever it is. So that's that's absolutely very important. And in the end, it is a choice, right? Just be aware of it first and then and go through the motion uh, of what you just suggested. So I, I really enjoy that. Now, one of the things that a lot of people don't talk about and one of the things that I tell my audience, my clients, and then that you're doing is that you take care of you first. You worked on you first before um, you, know, you were able now to be fully dead husband and that father that your family needs you to be right i think that is something that's huge important that nobody talks about because it's always like no my kids come first or no my wife comes first um right yeah i would i'm totally in agreement with you um 
I, I can use an analogy uh, or, or just some really basic uh, grounded principles for, for, for supporting what you're saying. Okay, mm. so I'm, I'm going to go to mothers for a moment. So I've worked a lot with female entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And what they do, that because they've got big, a lot of the, they've got big nurturing hearts, right? So this, yep. this is their life. This is where we're going. You'll get it straight away. So here they are with their staff. So just imagine they run a hair salon. They've got maybe 10, you know, eight or 10 girls working for them. So they're there really looking after their girls. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. And then, then they've got, then they're thinking, this is the business owner, the lady. Ah, oh, geez, I've got to get that meal for my husband tonight. And, and, and she's getting that. And then, then her children, oh, I've got to pick up the kids. And she's going, da, 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 da. And, she's, and then she gets a call from work. And so what this person will be doing is it, 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 all her energy goes to everybody else. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is what you're talking about now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and she's putting everyone else's needs first. Well, here's what happens to that person. Well, first of all, over time, they start to feel an anger. Mm -hmm. And then they start because... And they, they can never accept their anger. They'll start snapping at their kids. They start to feel snapping at people because they, 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 they're, they're, they've got this inner drive to serve everyone, but something in them that they're not owning, which is what you're talking about, is going, mm -hmm. you need to look after yourself. You need to look after yourself. You can't keep giving like this. But they ignore it because they feel guilty, like they're a bad person. Mm -hmm. right? Bad mum. Yeah, bad mum. Bad mum. Now. What happens is this always leads to um, a breakdown. So it leads to a psychological breakdown or a physical breakdown. So the person will be forced at some stage to address looking after themselves as the priority yep. um, to come back into balance. Now, the way that we look at this is like a battery. If you're giving, 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 if a battery keeps giving, it can no longer give. The battery mm -hmm. has to be filled back up. Yep. So if you understand that, then you know that your priority is to look after yourself. Okay. So as an example, I've, I, I support um, many, many people with my work. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you're looking at me right now and I'm very extroverted. Well, I can only be extroverted because I've been introverted. Mm -hmm. I've got my energy back. Okay. And taking time to process and think through things silently and, and, and quietly. So I would totally, totally agree with you, class. That's uh, an absolute priority. You've got to work on yourself. You've got to evolve yourself. You, 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 you can't be the captain of the ship unless you've got your own act together, as an example, can you? Mm -hmm. Exactly. No, no, I yeah. do. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Man, man, this time is flying. Um, bro, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely want to ask you, uh, Perry, can you share with our fellow entrepreneur dads a golden nugget, something that, you know, we haven't spoke about yet, but it's of high value to you and that you know can serve them to, you know. In, in this present time frame? It doesn't matter. Whatever you would love to share. Okay, the entrepreneurs, right. The game's changed. Mm -hmm. The game's changed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is funny, right? It was, it was funny. It's not funny. And I'll give you this. Uh, I'll give them that bit about uh, – a month ago, maybe five weeks ago, from having heaps of leads come into our business, we had no leads come into our business. Now, I knew it because I knew that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I've just spent a lot of time now working with my clients and helping them. And I've been restructuring them, pivoting them out of marketplaces that are in danger and then pivoting them into um, emerging markets. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I say this is that just over the last three or four days i'm very awake to the world's going to be a completely different place and if you're not awake at the moment you're going to be in trouble as an entrepreneur okay so I, i've actually pivoted my business completely um, mm -hmm. so i've pivoted into a area you have to know where the smart money's going mm -hmm. okay so what's going to happen over the next period of time is we're going to see emergent markets that we were that prior to this weren't going to be emerging markets. So now there's emerging markets. So it, it's about knowing where the smart money's going. That's, mm -hmm. that's important now, okay? And, and you've got to be aware of threats. So this, and you can't be lazy about what's happening. Don't, mm -hmm. think the don't, don't think 
the government's going to save you, even though they might with, with their bailout stimulus packages. But if you're of the person, if you're of the mind, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the government to save me. Well, that's not being entrepreneurial. That's not being proactive. That's mm-hmm. not standing up. You've got to be awake because certain sectors are going to close down. If you think your messaging from the from prior to this, especially if you're in information marketing, is you know I, I see these guys rolling out the same messaging. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's an affront to people. It's an affront to people. At this point in time, they've got a different dialogue going on because of, of the crisis. So, again, it's about if you're in business, finding and, and really studying the emerging markets because there'll be a lot of money to be made there. One of my goals, by the way, is to help people make a lot of money with a moral stance. Mm-hmm. Okay, because the other thing we're going to see over the next little while is you, who are you? We're going to see systematic, a systemic breakdown potentially. So who are you? Are you a moral good person or, or, or are you going to fall prey to all the lower nature activity that's going to go on, the blame, the anger, uh, you know, all that stuff that goes on? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I probably didn't answer the question. I probably went on half a well, No, no, no. I, I love it. I love it. But it's a good thing, right, that, that people finally really start looking at like, okay, are you, you know, are you ethical or are you just trying to get my money and then, you know. Co- correct. Yeah. Throw me away. That, that's good. I heard another cool thing. I don't know if that's going to be true, but you know, we, we might just get rid of all our money. Yeah. Right. Fine. And you start. I would love that. I saw people paying with their phone. I'm like that. That would be me because I hate walking around with money. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we're, I def- we're all, almost definitely going to a cashless society. No. Yep. Yeah. 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 Interesting, man. All right, Perry. Thank you so much. Uh, before we go, please share with us. I'll share the website right now where people can reach you. But what are other great ways to connect with you, to get to know more about you, to follow you, etc.? Uh, just sign up for anything on my website. You can go to my Facebook page. That's uh, you can actually go to my personal Facebook page. So I think that's uh, uh, under Perry Martin, or it's probably under. It could be under Europe Nodrum, which is my name backwards, which is Y R R E P. N O D R A M. I have a business uh, Facebook page under Facebook slash forward slash Perry Mardon. Um, yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not much of a Twitter person. I like reading Twitter. I think yeah, Twitter's. There's some great brains on Twitter. Mm-hmm, truth, absolutely. Oh, I am on Twitter. I actually am on Twitter, but it's not something I use too often. Mm. Yeah. All right, great. So for the people, this website you can find the comment section, but also in the description section and the Facebook page that Barry was talking about, you can also find in the description section. So make sure to check that out. Follow him. Make sure to ask that question. Like, dude, what, what do you think of the emerging market? Because, you know, that's what we got to figure out, you know? That's you right. Know, supporting our families. All right, everybody. Thank you so much, Barry, again. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Really appreciate it. And everybody have an amazing day. Stay safe. And we'll talk to each other very, very soon. Bye-bye. Yeah.